screen just to start with, and then we'll get to introductions. If anybody wants to try typing, just a quick hello, that will be most welcome. Hey, brilliant. Now, can you still see that? Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Screen, screen, so we have a few people that can't. This is going to be one of these slightly curious situations, I think. Change presenter. Oh. All right. So we have a bit of support going on. <coughs> May not work. So it might be the primary screen issue. I might just do it like this. How's that for everybody? Dynamic feedback, here we go. Still can't see the screen. Apologies, everybody. Normal service will be resumed in a moment. My presenter. There we go. That looks better, doesn't it? Ta da! By the magic of technology, thank you for bearing with us for that. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time out on a Monday evening uh, to listen to me. Uh, my name's Aaron and Thaya Paran. Uh, I'm a service architect um, or solution architect, and I'm currently working for the Department for Work and Pensions. <clears throat> so I wanted to spend uh, 30 minutes or so speaking just a little bit about what I think digital transformation means and what it means to be an architect trying to do some of those things. Um, we will have hopefully about 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please do just type them in. Um, Adele, who's sitting next to me, will be collating them and then we'll read them through and I'll provide any answers that I can and any help that I can. Um, also, just so that everybody knows, we'll be recording this presentation uh, and uh, the slides. Uh, so they'll be available through, I guess, the eSynergy site. Um, but also, please be aware that... Uh, uh, anything might be recorded for posterity, such as it might be. So, to get started with, um, I only have 10 or so slides, but I really wanted to talk about what it means to architect digital transformation um, and what digital transformation really means when it comes to implementing it. Um, <clears throat> by way of context then, uh, I have a few slides really just to give a bit of background. Um, there's a few more technology things that I do want to come and talk about. Uh, but to begin with, I think, especially from an architectural perspective, um, a lot of this is around the reason and the context around digital transformation. Uh, so this slide uh, comes from a Boston Consulting Group um, uh, publication um, <coughs> that they publish fairly regularly. Uh, there's a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's a link to this, but really it's this idea that um, digital transformation and adoption of digital technology is changing a whole range of industries, 
but different industries are at different points of maturity. So digital transformation isn't just a once and done activity, it really is quite an evolving story. Right at the top then, uh, probably the companies that you'd recognize, so media companies like Amazon, Netflix, uh, Apple with iTunes, um, you know, all of these are really now fully digital. Um, they very much work in an online space, um, very much uh, user-centric, data-driven services. You know, the whole idea of media being electronic delivery is very kind of now coupled together. So if you like, these are ones where, if you like, traditional industries have been significantly disrupted. Coming down a little bit, uh, certainly in some of the retail space uh, and telcos, financial services, there has been a big shift in digital technology. Um, I think there's a lot more expectation of customers and users of uh, digital interactions, what digital service might mean. Um, it has undoubtedly disrupted some things. You know, death of the high street's been often reported. Uh, high street's still there, but certainly everybody in the high street has an online presence. Uh, some services undoubtedly very technology heavy, like telcos, uh, financial services. Um, so we can see both in terms of how customers are interacting with some of those services, uh, but also with how they've delivered uh, and um, internally have their processes organized around digital delivery. Uh, those transformations have happened. But there's actually still a whole range of industries where kind of digitalization and digital transformation is still an ongoing story. Um, from fast moving consumer goods, uh, you know, some people are used to having uh, supply chain improvements. Uh, same in automotive, supply chain improvements. There's websites to, into, to engage with customers, you know, car configuration. Is it fundamentally transformative? Not sure. Getting into logistics, healthcare, energy. So, so in many respects, I think, this does show a bit of a wave. I think it shows that we should be looking at some of the leaders in what digital transformation looks like, if you're working in industries that are perhaps further behind in that curve. Uh, and we should be looking at the characteristics of those industries that have made them you know, ripe and amenable to digital transformation. So if I try and then distill a little bit of what we mean by digital transformation. Probably a few key points, I think. So fundamentally, there is something here around being able to launch and evolve new digital products. So you know, we're used to seeing things available through the web, new ways with engaging with content or procuring a service or getting support. But I think that's only half the story because the other part is around digitizing the internal processes. The whole point really is us delivering a front to back experience. And I'll come on to why that's important as we go through this a little bit. The next part is around focusing on user needs. It's not just internal users or external users, it's really everybody who might be stakeholders in these services. And that's really because the expectation that people have now is the services are targeted at them and it's focused on them. So it's going to engage new customers if they feel like it's talking to them. It's going to help streamline our delivery and throughput if it's supporting how internal users, internal stakeholders support and use these services. Final part really then is I guess the, um, it's kind of the, the carrot for why the world is a bit different, which is it's now being driven much more by quantitative insight. So we're using data insight, customer feedback. Um, we're using experiences of what happens. We're doing things like A-B testing. So being able to do two different services in parallel lets us learn an awful lot around what is it that's appealing? And really all that drives us to is this question of fundamentally, what is transformation? And what do you really want from a digital transformation? And I think at a very fundamental level, it must be doing things in a way that's simplifying it for users, minimizing the costs around delivery, 
maximizing the flexibility. What's interesting in those things is they're not just straightforward, I'll have one of those please. So these things are really about balance and trade-offs and to a degree I think that's the key story around why it's an architectural question of what's the right balance here. So um, I'm doing the speaking tonight, uh, but uh, a good friend and colleague, Ben Holliday, has provided a couple of slides that I have uh, mercilessly purloined for my own purposes. Um, the questions were really around design, not just design from a user design, but I think design can apply to what do we mean by designing contemporary services. And it's important because we're not just putting a digital facade on things, or we shouldn't be at least. It might be a start, it might help people understand how they can engage with a new channel, and it might be meeting some immediate need, which is, well, why can't I use my phone to tell you something that you've asked me about? But it's really that more profound question of delivering user needs, and it's delivering services that deliver the needs for all the users, not just kind of citizens or customers or clients, but really for all of the organization, what's the right way of doing it? So the design question, service design, going to user design, user interaction, must be about this question of how are we meeting user needs? Which takes us a little bit onto this idea of you know, how do you design right? And the challenge is really, in many respects, there's lots of things we can do, but the question is what do you do? There is something here about practitioners that have experience and judgment and intuition to understand what works, what's the right way to start. These are undoubtedly complicated subjects. Um, very few organizations will take lightly to doing things in a brand new way for a new set of customers with a new set of business processes uh, and adopt that without any uh, kind of side effects or any other kind of complexities. So really this question of why do we need to have good judgment and intuition, it's really about how do you decompose some of the complexity to make it work and make it work effectively. Second thing around, I think, designing right is very much around context. Uh, the world is constantly moving. And really, any one solution is much more now around why is it being used? What is the need? What is the context of somebody using it? What are they after? And it's going to change. I think in many respects, this is the, if you like, one of the motivating insights for the strap line to this talk which is the fact that things are changing and are constantly changing means that we need to have a much better way of handling that change. Things are not going to be static anymore and so we should be making sure that all of our engineering endeavors allow things to evolve in that flexible way because otherwise our customers and users will simply get annoyed and will either look elsewhere or will start making a noise about it. And actually what we're trying to do is delight users wherever we can, as often as we can. So, the strap line I had was, um, doing small things can make big changes. And I think this is really at the heart of why it's a really interesting time in software engineering. We've recognized the fact that the world is adaptive, things are evolving. It doesn't really matter if you think you're following an agile methodology or not. It's not about how you do things, it's about the world around us. Once we recognize that, then we're on to the question of what in our engineering allows us to build the capabilities to constantly adapt and evolve. So three basic things that spring to mind. Unless you have some feedback, how would you know you could do it better? It's really fundamental, I think, to understanding how are people going to respond and react? How are we going to capture that? 
and what can we do because of it? And that must mean that we are able to iterate rapidly. And that's not necessarily requiring, you know, hopefully lots of ceremony and complexity. Iterating rapidly at low cost must mean that we have lots of good technology that makes that work. And the final bit really is the kind of corollary to that, which is we want to avoid locking. We want to avoid things that mean that we can't adapt. Because one thing that you can pretty much be sure of is whatever's the best thing to do now is unlikely to be the best thing in five years' time. So we've got to find our ways of avoiding that locking, allowing ourselves to change and evolve. And I think this is the thing around the small things, because now the small things in software engineering allow both big teams, who historically could afford these massively expensive tools in the old world, but now small teams, because actually we can all use the same sets of technologies which are available with open source licenses, um, with lots of experience about how to implement them, and no longer is it only the ability of the big companies to do serious enterprise-grade software engineering. So yeah, that's why it's a really interesting time in this space. So there's just a couple of points that I think I wanted to talk about, and I think any one of these could be easily a topic of conversation for uh, other sessions and for many, many hours, quite frankly. Because there's one thing, if you get a few architects in the room, is we can all argue till the cows come home. But if I think one of the key things is around the ability to iterate and evolve quickly, then we need to look at what are the things that will allow us to do that. So a couple of things that I think are really helpful and useful. Uh, in the architectural space, in kind of a solution architecture space, the concept of microservice and perhaps fine-grained service orientated architectures is undoubtedly a helpful thing. I think the interesting thing around much of our world of digital transformation is these aren't new ideas. Ideas about loose coupling, the fact that one thing can change and that shouldn't break something else, and high cohesion, it should do just one thing, do it well, but only that one thing. Those ideas have been around since the 70s, well described, well understood, but really we keep on evolving better and better implementations of that based on our experience of doing things. So I think microservice architecture, from my perspective at least, is really about a really smart contemporary way of implementing some of those ideas. So what's the kind of things and the themes behind those ideas? Well, at some level, it gives us independence. It's independence of deploying things. So previously, I might have had to have lots of components all bundled together. And at some point, I might get to some threshold of what my block, I don't want to call it monolithic necessarily, but what my kind of block of components needs to do. And I might then have multiple versions or stacks of that, the kind of stovepipe scalability model. So I just have lots of those, but they're all still these big blocks. The world that we can get to when we start having more flexibility in the interfaces between services, and we're using standard technologies, is we can now look at these as independent deployable units, and we can look at these as separately scalable units. One of the key things around uh, the use of, I think, web technologies and a microservice architecture is all of that engineering that lets us scale web environments is now supporting scaling kind of the enterprise as well. If I need to put a new processing engine because of some end of month or end of year or option expiry processing, well, I should be able to spin those things up becomes especially strong and powerful if I've got flexibility in my environments so I can spin up more compute capability, then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm now operating this wonderful on-demand world. So those things are really powerful, really helpful, and very much one of the reasons why you know, small teams can now build really significant, impressively scaled things. 
The other part, I think, which is really important, and this is even going to any sophisticated views of microservices, is this idea of very kind of strong bounded encapsulation. At some level, I might stop caring about what languages I build different microservices in. I might build one in C++, if I want to be really fast. I might use one in, you know, perhaps a bit more Ruby if I want to just prototype some front-end stuff. I might build a bunch in Java. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that my entire system has to be homogeneous and all the same. There are good reasons why I'd want them to be similar, I and mean, clearly the more um, disparate set of technologies I use, the more supportability and maintainability issues I'm going to get into. But fundamentally, if I need to upgrade the version of one thing, perhaps it's just that one service component gets changed. And I might do that to avoid a uh, bug fix or a technology flaw. I might uh, want to go to a later version of it. I might want to refactor it because actually I think I could do it better with the benefit of hindsight and experience. So in many respects, this idea of creating development nimbleness, buying heavy encapsulation, using standard web technologies is at least for me at the heart of why microservices are a good starting point. There's an awful lot you can go to after this as well. Uh, and lots of things that we could kind of start getting to and start considering in terms of how do we create a much more service orientated architecture. But even if you stop there, you still got a massive benefit. Um, there's an awful lot of material around this. So I don't want to go into too much detail here. So Martin Fowler, uh, from ThoughtWorks and lots of ThoughtWorks uh, staff have an awful lot of information around this. Um, so I highly recommend you go to the link. There's lots of other articles that fall off the back of that. Um, so moving on, um, it's not just development that we want to be nimble with. Much of this again is around the full front to back working efficiently and quickly with low costs, uh, low uh, impediments to iterating quickly. So, one thing that's interesting is documentation. And yet, yeah, how do we do documentation and articulation of what the service is and how we support it? Um, one good way, I think, and it's undoubtedly a good foundation building point again, is test-driven and behavior-driven development. Again, it's not new, I'd argue. Uh, the whole idea of testing with preconditions, behavioral testing and post-conditions has always been part of what a unit test and a system test and an integration test should be describing. The things that were different, though, was really about articulating the behavior of the system in a language that everybody that's building it, from people specifying as analysts to developers to the testers, have uniformity and a common way of describing it. At the end of this, ideally, because again we have a system that's going to be iterating frequently, we want to have a documentation set that kind of falls off the back. So using these kinds of styles really help. Uh, things like Cucumber to describe tests is a really good way of doing the high level test. It still doesn't mean that you don't want to be going into understanding how you do integration and link testing, how you do smoke tests of different behaviors. Uh, and you may end up with a very, very big test suite in order to, to support all of the testing that you want to have. But things like using these techniques that mean that effectively out of the back of your development process, you have your documentation, is a massive boon to being able to be nimble and iterating our services. And the third part really, from having a sensible architecture to having a way of describing the system, is having a way to actually getting the system out in front of users. So this is probably one of the areas that um, lots of people, when they talk about development ops and web ops, are getting to. Fundamentally, again, this is just really good practice. There's a fundamental observation here, which is 
yeah, every developer's a bit lazy at heart, and I was when I was doing this a lot more. So to start with, you might use Java C for the first few times, and then you switch to Ant, then you can get a bit bigger, and you might switch to Maven, and it gets a bit bigger, and you might switch to Gradle. In one respect, you know, people in our industry like to automate the repetitive tasks. And having a system that can do these things is really helpful and important to increasing this cadence, this ability to release frequently and quickly, because it means the system does the heavy lifting. I think the real thing then is, this is one of those points where you should probably never think yourself finished. Once you have a pipeline that lets you build, then can you get your pipeline packaged for different environments? Then can you get it to promote between environments? Then can you get make sure that all the tests are running successfully? Then can you finally do all the things that means that at the end of all of this, everything that you build effectively is as good a quality as a release candidate for your final system? Because if you can do that, effectively everything that you're building, going through your build pipeline, using tools like Jenkins, um, using things like uh, pop for your repos, puppet to manage your environments, um, using things like Vagrant to be able to recreate in, um, environments, uh, maybe using Docker if you want to go into containerization, try and go a bit lightweight. All of these things are really, really important to kind of be able to release this frequently, this frequency and keep things moving. And effectively, again, this is another one of those places where um, the tools just continually evolve. There's, you know, if there are any one of those problem spaces from continuous integration to environment management to containerization, you know, different tools will come out. There are different versions. Some will be stronger than others. Some will improve quicker than others. Um, much of, I think, the architectural consideration in this is, again, back to lock-in, but now we're talking about lock-in from a build environment perspective. I think as long as you are constantly investing in your web ops and DevOps capability, I think as long as you are always looking to see how can you improve the pipeline, because really I feel like the anti-pattern is when you start avoiding doing things because you know it wouldn't work very well or would be a bit slow, that's a real focus for the attention to say, can we do that bit better? And that might be moving from VMs into containers. Might work just for some parts, might allow some better parallelization of your build environments. All of those things, though, I think are a constant maintenance uh, and management of your environments, which means that at the end of this, you're getting to the point where you can release frequently, safely, without any drama or ceremony. And that's got to be the big goal in this. Oh. So, in one respect, I think, just want to tie this together now, um, and then tie up this, really. The bit around small things was very much around the things that help us do software engineering. So the smallest of those things, from can I just build my code effectively, to can I manage my environments, to can I decompose my architecture of my technology, my solution, such that uh, I've got flexibility, nimbleness, and adaptiveness. Those are all quite small things. Any small team could start doing that. They don't require lots of ceremony or, or, uh, uh, or complexity in and of themselves. But what's really interesting, I think, is these are embedding new capabilities in the organizations. <clears throat> they really are quite um, uh, foundation building for doing things in a new way. And the motivation for doing things in a new way was back to saying things are changing constantly and rapidly. So we want to be able to iterate constantly and rapidly. So now this engineering is part and parcel of operating a new business in this way. <clears throat> it's even for existing businesses, this is kind of key and fundamental. It's essentially um, 
as that first slide showed in terms of the adoption of digital transformation, digital technologies, it's the disruptive effects of people coming in with these capabilities that will change existing organizations and will force them to evolve and adapt. So it's an interesting situation where all of a sudden that software engineering capability is a really big significant enabler for transformational way that we look at designing services, how we present them to users and how we present them internally. The fact that enterprise grade tools are now available to everybody doesn't require uh, expensive licenses of Oracle with Rack to have high availability anymore. I can find lots of technologies that can do replication. I can architect my systems in a particular way that means I don't need to have expensive technologies for certain problem classes. Again, it's not to say that everything magically goes open source, and it's not to say that we can't abandon all of the support and maintenance that's needed. What is interesting is I can buy an Amazon X large instance with my credit card just as much as I can buy a small instance. And then all of a sudden, I can start running Mongo and start running very high performance throughput systems with relatively little investment. Whereas in the past, you know, I might have been only looking at big IBM power series machines to do that kind of lifting up. So there's this real democratization in what's available to people and also how that evolves over time. I think the real then consequence of that is architecture isn't an ivory tower endeavor anymore. It's really about understanding these small things, but these things that are really enabling. It's about understanding those user needs and the design questions, because it was the design that was driving this. It was the design that was saying, we're not just putting a digital front end, we're seeing if we can do things in a better way, in a lower cost way, in a better service way. And in many respects, this isn't a, here's a lovely document, now go off and build it anymore. It's a living, breathing system and service that's going to constantly react to feedback that we get from customers and citizens that reacts to how the system itself is behaving. So it's recognizing if it's not working well, it needs to have more capacity, perhaps it can scale its own capacity. If it can heal itself, perhaps it can do that itself. So all of those things are um, developing capabilities and evolving capabilities. And it's not something that, that's easily or well documented just in isolation and abstracted from building it. So I think in the new world, architects are very much hands-on and hands-in. And even if you're doing more business architecture into the technical architecture, those considerations are really pervasive because actually, again, the question is, what's the right place to start? How do we start learning and gaining insights? So it's not some easy strategy into, I'll build one of those, please. It's get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves. But guess what? These tools are really interesting. And what you can do with them is just terrific. I think the final thing around digital transformation is understanding the blend of people and experience. It's very difficult, actually, to start doing this in a profound way because you have to bring a lot of viewpoints that were previously isolated. It's already having everything part of one transformation team able to represent user needs or go out and elicit user needs where it's appropriate, understand the service delivery considerations, understanding the risks, the other organizational imperative, understanding how the technology is into play. There's always going to be pressures. Uh, everybody's always going to want something yesterday, but also we've also got to recognize that this is a voyage of experience uh, and, uh, and a bit of a journey. And so you know, we can't cut short having the experience. What we want to make sure that we've got is having the infrastructure and the plumbing that lets us learn from the experience. So something really important here around making sure the right group of people are involved. 
Uh, and I think that also very much relates to being able to play in all these different considerations. You know, it, it's very much now the world from, uh, at least from my perspective in architecture, that it's, it's a constant uh, alignment between different groups. It's a constant play of different considerations. It's understanding different rates of change. Getting the right blend of people, right blend of experience, understanding the right way to decouple, decompose, build out and learn solutions and problems is the story going forwards. Um, and I think that was really the main gist of what I wanted to talk about. Um, in many respects, there's an awful lot more that we could talk about. And there's an awful lot more to what it means to do full whole scale digital transformation. I think if you're starting off on one of these endeavors, understanding the plumbing that really helps and enables it is by far the best way to get going. And much of these things is about actually doing it. Um, analysis paralysis is pervasive because there's lots of things that you can do. But often the best way of learning is just to do. So with that, I will throw open any questions. Right, so here we go. So let me um, da, 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 da. let me pick out one. Where are we going? So question here: um, What were some of the major hurdles you had to overcome, milestones reached during your transformation? So uh, thanks, Mars. It's a really good question. Uh, so I think. First thing I'll say is transformations only just started. Um, you know, these are a long journey, uh, and there are lots of complexities as you start doing these things. I think the biggest hurdles are really around getting started. Um, it's quite a new way of doing things, and it's not that these things weren't being done before, but getting things cracking starting to understand what factors are at play, building the experience of what's working, and building out the experience of what's workable is really what the story is all about. There are lots of technologies and capabilities, but again, those can be evolved over time. So I think this is a story of momentum. Um, I think, again, as, as with any iterative approach anyway, um, it's really around building that momentum building that experience, not expecting that every problem is going to be the same or homogenized. Uh, so I think once you start that going, then you have the foundation. And once you start getting into a world where you're releasing you know, very frequently, so just a matter of weeks, and you're improving things on that kind of cadence, all of a sudden things that were hitherto really unimaginable are just possible. You get some feedback, Change the next release. It's only out in a couple of weeks. It's just a lovely story to tell. Um, question from Philip. So where is the DWP on the digital journey maturity as per slide one? Um, so again, it's a really good question. I think um, government in general, uh, and DWP is one of the major government departments, is again really in the middle of the journey. The journey did start a number of years ago, um, really through government digital services, GDS, uh, and all the cabinet office uh, activities from kind of 2010, 2011. Um, the part of the key thing is building a portfolio of activities. So no organization can do lots of very large scale changes all at the same time because things need time to bed in. And also, you get benefit from doing small things as well as big things. So I think a lot of this is around building out that capability and experience. So there's a whole range of things in the pipeline. I think government in general is doing more on the front and starting to work through the challenges of what the delivery going through involve. Um, and that's really as well because some of the government services are quite complicated. I think there are some services which are much more akin to what you find in the private sector. 
uh, you know, much more as a citizen I want to you know, perhaps uh, tax my car. So there are no reasons why that shouldn't be a very straightforward activity. Um, where the state's providing some much more tailored support for you, there's obviously a lot more to be uh, considered and involved in that. So, question from, uh, let me just try and pick out one. Okay, so one from Claire says, the question is more about process when speaking to users and stakeholders. Um, I can imagine some would have been resistant to change. How would your team, how did you and your team get around that? So, I think the key thing with that is around starting with process design. There are two parts of saying, do we understand what it is we're trying to achieve? So what do our users want? And generally users don't want you know, a pretty website. They want to do something that has business value, makes their life better, makes things quicker, easier, less resistance for them. So there's a fundamental question of saying, have we understood that? And I think then the question on the process is saying, almost put the technology to, to a side for a moment, based on what we're learning about what our users want, and bear in mind sometimes users want unreasonable things, and they often want kind of contradictory things with other users. So understanding that moderating factor, how though can we best organize ourselves to deliver that? And in the same way that we don't want to have very flexible technology, but guess what, we can't change the business processes more than once every six months. We haven't got that organizational nimbleness that's important to us. Um, I think, again, if you take the analogy with some of the other industries, you can see where people are being more adaptive and responsive. Uh, and so I think there's the question of what's our expectation to be able to respond to these changes. Most organizations, though, I think recognize the fact that they have to be fast on their feet. And they have to be nimble. Um, and I think it's playing those things out. And again, part of the question of where do you focus your activity, which well, should be on the things where you think the transformation story is the strongest, where you make the best return. Something happens very smoothly, and there isn't much um, uh, intervention required, and you've already had it for a number of years. Well, that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's not where your bang for buck is. So hopefully that kind of makes some sense from, a, from an adoption perspective. I think process analysis is the key. Um, so, a question from um, Satish. Um, are you using any service discovery or monitoring tools at the start of your microservices? Are you building your microservices and answering the monitoring and service discovery separately? Um, so, I think this is a little bit around enterprise maturity and a little bit about where you interject that oversight, that environment management and application management oversight. As a starting perspective, I think, and the reason why I like you know, a, the microservice uh, kind of evangelism, if you will, is the idea of using RESTful web technology-based interfaces just lets me put distribution and boundaries wherever I need to. Stitching those into monitoring, stitching those into perhaps transaction management systems is an entirely feasible thing to then do. And again, I've always got this moderating question of some factor of saying there are lots of good bits of infrastructure plumbing that we need to get in place. Equally, the point is about showing business value by doing something that helps users. And in that, there's a question of what's appropriate at what scale. I think inevitably, there are always points of refactoring. And those points of refactoring are often a kind of scale discontinuities. I think hopefully though, with a lot of the technologies that are being put forward in this space, those technologies do have quite a high theoretical scaling limit. Lots of pitfalls, lots of things that can go wrong. But again, I think one of the architectural questions and perspectives are just the you know, again, classic question of saying, how have you made sure you haven't architect yourself into a dead end. Again, the point of open interfaces, standard protocols, is much more about allowing us flexibility in those things, 
We don't have container locking, hopefully anymore. We're not talking about vendor-specific solutions. So actually, I should be able to look across the suite of tools and technologies to find out what things are going to, again, help me get to that next level of scaling. Question from Vic, and Vic, thank you. I know there have lots of questions coming in, and I've kind of struggled to keep up with them. Um, so, uh, good point here, which I think, in my opinion, uh, one of the major facets, and missing in my presentation, I totally accept that as well, uh, is delivering things to the cloud, uh, and actually where we run services. So, I completely agree, uh, and I think this is really why the WebOps capability is such an important one. In many respects, one of the biggest places where we're seeing, obviously, um, cost efficiencies is in commodity infrastructure. So we would be kind of crazy not to support and enable that. There are always considerations. So there's always the paranoia of on-premise versus off-premise and control and management and oversight and all of those factors. I think, really, though, there is something here about saying, at the very least, we should be architecting everything that we have to work happily in a hybrid infrastructure and a hybrid cloud environment. If I'm running something on-premise and I want to shift it to the cloud because of perhaps scalability or to support load management and capacity, perhaps I can do that. I can also go the other way. I could perhaps spin it up in the cloud because I've got lower cost environments. I can just tear them down whenever I need them. No kind of uh, capex, only opex cost involved. So I might have all my development environments in there, but I might get more paranoid about my production data and therefore want to run that more on prep. I think really what we're trying to make sure we get to, again from an architectural perspective, is all of our services are location agnostic, and then we're picking the right infrastructure tools and the right infrastructure hosting for the right jobs. I think there are lots of considerations, which is why people are uh, you know, just mindful and careful about these things, and those considerations are all right. Um, and I think, again, as we evolve more patterns for how you can do this safely and securely, uh, we'll have a better depth of experience uh, and, and a better playbook to draw upon. Um, but I think there's also lots of already great examples of people using um, uh, commodity infrastructure for things which are you know, notionally quite sensitive and private, whether you're you know, being careful with your data or managing how the processing is works. There's loads of things you can do. Um, so let's uh, let me go for a machine question from Sheen. So when there are an array of technologies available, how would you choose the right ones? Um, again, great question. At one level, it's just about, I think, getting started with something that has the right characteristics that you're comfortable with and using that to learn from. Um, there is something you know, profoundly important about the fail fast mentality. So understanding locking, understanding when it's right to say, no, that wasn't right, let's do it again or let's do it differently. I think again, the architectural consideration in all of this is making sure that we maintain the value in what we've done, whether that's learning of the problem space, whether that's code that we could run in a different container, whether that's changing our hosting strategy and monitoring strategy. You know, those, those are all right things that I think will, will constantly evolve. Um, getting started yeah, analysis paralysis is just a killer for so many places, so many projects um, that I think, you know, once you've got that under your belt, then you start going. I think the other thing just to avoid is kind of synthetic arbitrary arguments about A is better than B. Again, I think it's more of a question of eyes wide open. How do we get ourselves going? What do we learn? What's the right checkpoint? It requires some stakeholder management because people classically see a prototype and say, when can I have it in production, please? So, yeah, that's a real thing that uh, I think you have to be very mindful of. Uh, but I think that, again, is all part of evolving, iterating quickly. Um, so let me do a question from Sai, which is the role of testers and QAs in the digital transformation. Um, 
So I think, as I had in the presentation in the slides, I think they're absolutely key and crucial. Um, in many respects, the whole point of having a build pipeline from the analysis to the developers to the QAs is just the key thing that you're maintaining and nurturing. The questions of, you know, do you have a number of QAs man marking your developers? That's the kind of thing that you want to be thinking through. Because essentially what you're looking at, especially if you're doing a more of an agile build environment, managing the throughput of your development and managing uh, the throughput of getting things into different environments and into, ultimately into production. So QA is really key to that. I think as well as that, you've really got to talk your way and understand your way through all the different levels of quality assurance that's appropriate. So all the different kinds of tests, uh, all the different kinds of testing that's relevant. One of the great things that I think QAs in the new world uh, should be you know, really embracing is in many respects they are now some of the team that are automating different parts of the build pipeline. You know, they might be automating um, testing, browser-based testing of the web interfaces. Um, it's not really for developers, it's not really for web ops, but you know, good QAs should be you know, banging that space, cracking on with those things. So I think those are the kinds of skills and skill sets which are really important, really interesting. Um, and the other part I think that's important is QAs really are that level of assurance, again, back to saying that we're looking at behavior and test-driven development and looking at documenting in a lighter way as possible what's being built. So QAs are kind of saying, at the end of all of this, do we have a document set that we think is maintainable, is understandable? Have I understood it from my responsibility as a QA? Do I think that if I wander off and someone else replaces me, they could pick it up? So I think you know, QAs is just one of the, the key roles that previously it was just you know, pushing data sets and testing. I think it's a lot more important than that now. Um, so, let me just do a couple more, and then, again, you've been very kind to bear with me on a Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Um, but question from Joe. Um, so the question here was, how does the organization approach prioritization? Um, and I guess that's a reflection for uh, you know, different organizations in different places of their maturity. <clears throat> I think this is, a, again, you know, these are these are really just part and parcel of the you know, great questions for architects and the architectural consideration. Again, it's hard. It's hard because there's always competing demands. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and all, as always, everybody wants something yesterday. Um, it's also a journey of discovery, as I said. So you can't shortcut that learning experience. I think, therefore, the best response, really, is understanding what's the portfolio of activities. We're not just developing digital products, we're upskilling an organization. We're upskilling the, deliver, the development and delivery organization. We're also upskilling an operations organization, um, which is true for, for you know, any company really that now starts getting services that are changing frequently. So perhaps unless you were Amazon and you built yourself from the ground up around those concepts, any traditional logistics-based business, all of a sudden getting these new data insights and they're thinking, right, what do I do with this stuff? Um, so I think the story there is around understanding the portfolio of activity. Um, the portfolio as well has to be addressing a whole range of considerations. Um, you know, what's the right starting points? What's the right way of managing the risk? And there's always risks of doing new things. There's always risks of developing new parts of infrastructure. Um, you know, it's always going to be a challenge being the first. So you want to find the right case examples to do first. And then you want to understand how you take those to other problems and how you perhaps industrialize it inside the organization to support other projects and programs. Um, I think it's as well these techniques and, and this approach is an education for an organization and for its governance structures. So again, there's no straightforward answer, I'm afraid. But I think, again, if you are 
transparent as to what it is you might learn, which might be as much about the journey as it is about the destination. And if you can get people to buy into that concept, then you can get sensible prioritization happening. Otherwise, you'll always be late because it should have been delivered yesterday, and that's just no fun for anybody. And I think we pick one more. Uh, so final question from Claire. Let me just do the, so how is digital transformation in government different from other sectors? Um, I think government's just an interesting environment. Public sector is undoubtedly interesting compared to um, private enterprise. Um, in many respects, the service expectation of users is similar because they've now been brought up on the expectation that they have from interacting with um, you know, your web giants, um, your banks, you know, much of your day-to-day -day life, online shopping now, you know, grocery shopping, all of these things, that, that's kind of pervasive. So people have that expectation. I think what's different with government is there's such a broad range of services from things which are really, as I said before, very standard, perhaps you know, like buying a tax disc, it's just, just feels like a transaction that I should be able to do whenever I need to, all the way to saying, you know, I've been, you know, can I have some support because of a impairment makes me getting to work, uh, make getting to work for me a challenge, um, and I need to have, you know, but this, it's the right thing to do to support that person because it means they're a useful contributing member of society. So once you've got such a broad range of services, it really is about trying to break those down into more meaningful and easier to deliver chunks. I think the scope of the public sector is just fascinating and interesting. Um, it's just you know, such an important thing. It touches so many people's lives. Um, so I think that's on its plus side. But undoubtedly, any large organization, and public sector is undoubtedly a very, very large organization, is a real challenge to work in and to make new changes, new transformations effective. Um, and that's, if you like, the challenge that we find ourselves in. Right. Final question with three minutes to go from Florian, um, which is again a little bit about our experience. So how far into the journey are you with the changes? People, processes and resources. Um, so I think we are, uh, I get to kind of, <laughs> I apologize for a, um, uh, a not a very good answer, answer in this case. Uh, so I think we're making really good progress, um, but uh, much of this is about it being part of, if you like, the DNA of an organization. So once, it's not the first service that I think is the acid test that has it really work, it's the 10th and the 50th. It's that, it's part of the fabric of how things are done and how things are going to get done. And it's also having that ability to say, we've just learned this feedback, maybe just in the last day or so. Can we fix that? Can we respond to that? I think having that kind of infrastructure, that kind of organization and governance, and that kind of mindset uh, is really the, the, the change to, to a BAE function. I think what you'll find, and I think any organization doing this kind of transformation is, again, it's not an ivory tower exercise, so let's pick one, make it work well, build things around that, and then start picking the next one and the next one and the next one. We've got quite a lot on the go now, so we're building up a really broad range of experience ourselves. Um, but again, really it's the experience such that you know what works for you, because again, context is everything. So with that, I will wrap up. Thank you all for taking the time on this Monday evening for listening to me. I hope it was interesting, and I hope it was somewhat informative. Uh, if you have any feedback, I'd be more than welcome to accept it. Um, if there's any other things that people would like to talk about potentially as well, I have to take any other topics that people want to, to go through. And I know I only um, ran over very quickly a whole range of different ideas and concepts. So again, it's entirely possible we could do more on any one of those. So with that, thank you very much. Have a lovely Monday evening and thank you for your time. Bye now.